Hello, dear digital ship friends. Welcome to our webinar exploring how maritime visa technology is evolving with our guest speaker, Jens Everling, who is the product manager of visa at Cobham Satcom. We'll be discussing the changing market landscape, evolving satellite networks, challenges and benefits that lay ahead of shipping. We encourage you to ask a lot of questions. Simply send them to a Q&A box anytime during this webinar. And I'm inviting Carl Jeffrey, founding editor of Digital Ship, to start our conversation. Well, thank you very much, Vida. So the topic we're talking about today is Maritime VSAT and how it's evolving and where it's going. So I'm not sure how much you already know about Maritime VSAT. So I thought I'd start with where we were 10 years ago. So we had three sorts of SATCOM. You had uh, satellites going at loyal orbit, this is 10 years ago, and handheld devices. And then there were services with bigger terminals and higher radio, radio frequency, higher bandwidth, higher expense, satellites further away. That's like Inmarsat services. And then uh, we used to have services with a much bigger terminal, like up to two meters, higher radio frequency, higher cost, higher bandwidth, and satellites are also far away. And we call that VSAT. So that was all quite easy to understand 10 years ago. But now we've got a slightly different picture happening because uh, VSAT seems to be getting much bigger and it's not just the uh, the geostationary satellites that are far away we're also got VSAT services on a no orbit, earth orbiting satellite so we will have in the future so we've got Viasat satellites being launched in 2022, OneWeb satellites in 2022, SES in 2024, Inmarsat satellites on 2024 to 2025 so that's all uh, VSAT and we're talking about gigabits per second available to one ship um, VSAT, so it means very small aperture terminal. That's got that name because it's very high radio frequency, which means firing the communications very precisely from the ship to the satellite, through, which means like a very small hole. That's a, not really a term you really need to understand, but uh, I guess what you want to understand is you're going to get more data bandwidth, which everybody wants. The technology is proving, improving, get more robust. Um, you've got more choices of satellites, so it gets less expensive. So. We've had predictions that just about every ship will have VSAT by 2027 and 11,000 maritime installations every year until then. Um, now, what might also happen is shipping companies might want to have more than one satellite network at once so you can get the most out of them. So you'll have to understand how they all work, or at least you'll have hardware and software that understands how it all works and does it all for you because shipping companies have different needs. You've got sensors on board, you want to communicate absolutely reliably. You want to protect yourself from cyber attacks. You want the crew to be able to use YouTube and Netflix probably. One of the key differences between the satellite networks is the orbit they go at, which um, influences the latency. So that sounds a bit technical. What it means is the time it takes the data to go to the satellite and down again. So that's very short if the satellite is near the Earth and it's uh, slightly longer. Well, so it's still like less, less than a second, but it's quite difficult to do uh, typing on a remote software if you've got a satellite that's 36,000 kilometers away. So our speaker today, Jens Ewerling, is based in Copenhagen. He's a former master mariner. And he's been involved in satellite communications equipment for about 20 years. So before we start, we've got a poll question. So we're going to try and get you thinking about this latency question. So the question is, how important is latency in your choice of connectivity solution? So latency I can't think of the actual seconds, but it's uh, very, very, very short if it's a uh, 700 kilometers away satellite and it's uh, possibly long enough to notice if the satellite's 36,000 kilometers away. So uh, if you'd like to uh, an answer this one, and if you don't know, you can tick the last one because hopefully we'll be explaining it a little bit more. Should we uh, bring up the results now, Vida? Yes, of course. I still see that some people are voting. So we give a couple seconds. Okay, it seems that the result has stabilized. I'm sharing the results. So it seems that the second question got most of the votes. So it's a pretty important uh, latency. You can manage without, uh, you can manage without, uh, what's mission critical means you actually must have um, millisecond communications, but uh, quite a lot of people would like to know more about it. So hopefully that uh, leads nicely into uh, so I'd like to invite Jens to give the uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. I, uh, 
I'm assured that uh, my presentation is online. Otherwise, uh, uh, please uh, let me in. No, fine. Thank you very much for, for having me this morning. Um, a great opportunity to share some information. Um, the angle into this uh, presentation is uh, the future of maritime visa. And um, there is more news coming out of our business, our part of the maritime and marine electronics business in the next five years will probably be the most exciting years in the history of satellite communication. Uh, with many new players and also the incumbent players uh, beefing up their, um, their satellite fleets and, and services, there is certainly a lot uh, uh, going on during the next five years. So this is, uh, I want to share information about that and what that means and what the consequences are. So I will be speaking about the satellite constellations, which means uh, orbit definitions, um, just to make these terms um, a talking topic, because um, that's uh, something uh, decisions will be made on in the future. Um, and then a lot of uh, talk about uh, low Earth orbit uh, satellites, and I will just briefly go through the advantages and disadvantages of a typical LEO constellation. And then as a, as a uh, summary, what does this mean for maritime SATCOM systems? Um, and uh, yeah, look at some of the uh, uh, mega constellations or large constellations of the future uh, with a lot of different uh, uh, types of satellites. And then of course, um, as the hardware maker, I can share information what that means for for the antennas that have to go on the vessel. So the poll we just did, thank you, Carl. So I will dive right in um, to the future of the maritime VSAT when it comes to the multiple orbits. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Can you please share your screen? We don't see your slides yet. Thank uh, you. Okay. I had done that before. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so these are the uh, low Earth orbit uh, definitions, uh, medium Earth, Earth orbit definitions, and the the geos and the even the heos, which will play a role in the future. So these distinct um, types of uh, satellite orbits uh, who are flying around Earth at uh, different uh, altitudes. Um, and, and fulfilling different tasks and, and, and job today. There are plenty of low Earth orbit and medium Earth orbit, like for example, Global Star and GPS is Mio and so forth. Everything is, there's a lot of that out there already. So my, this, these are the, the data which is available, different latencies. Uh, of course, it's still physics, meaning that the, the further the satellite, as Carl implied, is away from the Earth, uh, the longer the latency. Um, but with one satellite, you can cover a lot more ground uh, quite literally. So that that's is the trade off. But we will talk a little bit about that uh, going forward. It's just that in the future of maritime communication, a maritime visa, uh, there will be talk about these different orbits. And it is to make a choice. And we will talk about that uh, a little later. The general advantage of a LEO constellation is, of course, that's uh, in general, that should be lower path loss. Uh, and of course, as they are closer to Earth, lower latency. Um, and uh, a lot of the possibilities here with, with spectrum reuse and so forth uh, can be depending on the antenna size for sure. Um, a general advantage for an operator is that the um, a single uh, LEO satellite can be quite, quite uh, inexpensive. Um, to build, it depends on what kind of uh, technology you put in there. Are there inter-satellite links? Are there, are there how many ground stations, how landing stations uh, are there with a LEO constellation? That all factors into the advantages of, of a LEO constellation, how it's designed um, and uh, what, the, uh, what the business case is. The, uh, so there is definitely a, a demand for LEO because yes, there has been 25 years of, of Iridium success uh, gradually, of course, um, which we are witnessing. Um, 
and uh, for the uh, for the future constellations, it might look a little bit different. So there are there are some some commercial risks here. Um, even as uh, somebody like Elon Musk has said that he would like to be the first Leo company that doesn't go bankrupt after one or two years. Uh, that's his words, not mine. Um, and uh, so they are working hard to, to make this an attractive uh, proposition. But you need many satellites um, for these uh, Leo networks. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, and also they have shorter lifespan. So you, there will be new satellites coming um, all the way. And it's uh, quite possible that you can, um, like Iridium did, you can fly new satellites into the constellation um, and, and keep this young and, uh, and up to date uh, all the time. That, that is, of course, um, an, 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 uh, both an advantage and a, uh, for, for a Leo constellation. From our perspective, uh, what that looks like is uh, basically, this is the model you have today. I will now activate the little laser pointer here. Um, the scenario is that one antenna in either C, K, U, K, A band, in the case of military, even X band, um, point at uh, one satellite at a time. Um, this is typically the geo 36,000 kilometers away from earth. Um, and the pointing accuracy for a VSAT system is 0 0.2 degrees. So this is uh, the machine. This antenna has quite an important role to play to, to make something like that happen. Going forward, if we move to the right of the timeline here, you see the two antennas in the middle. Um, that's the scenario we are looking at um, for ships um, to uh, get uh, either Mio or Leo connectivity in the future you would need two parabolic antennas to be point be able to point at these satellites because in the case of Mios and Leos um, the satellites are moving and also Heos of course uh, in the in the future and this is why a handover between the two antennas would have to happen like every one or two minutes um, and this is uh, a little performance these two antennas have to do in the future there might be smaller ones that not like the standard and maritime visa is still one meter that may get a little smaller uh, when it comes to uh, to antennas and user terminals for leos and mules into the future this is uh, just a little teaser here of course there is uh, for certain market segments for certain tasks there could be um, uh, active electronically steered antennas. Um, and that is, of course, we're researching that. There's no secret um, and uh, actively even, and uh, it will play a role that the, the advantage of, of an AESA uh, could be that, that you, instead of having two parabolic antennas, you can point at two satellites at the same time with just one antenna. So that's, that's something uh, we, we have to research the viability and, and the market for that, but that's certainly something which, which is an exciting uh, consideration going forward for some vessels, not all, um, but uh, yes, that's certainly an exciting development. Okay, the benefits of these uh, satellite constellations in, with either lower latency or very high bandwidths and and it's not um, one, one satellite network will do, be able to do everything. Sure, a lot of applications have been adapted to the operated and low latency satellite connections. There's plenty and plenty of applications for that around. So there are still very powerful geo satellites in the pipelines. Um, so it's not everything, not the answer to everything is not always the LEOs and the MEOs. Uh, contrary to some of the hype, perhaps, uh, but the benefits for ships and applications is it definitely also from the from the very powerful geos will be higher bandwidths uh, for individual ships. So meaning, and then uh, maybe from the Leos and Mios, lower latency, um, the network design on board of a ship can become something different rather than just limiting the internet to people. Uh, you can open it up for much more when you have the throughput and you have the high bandwidth. Um, so there, there will be dedicated data channels for the internet of things. So all the onboard data being collected and then sent to shore and depending on the vessel also 
um, in real time, uh, certainly for ferries and, and uh, coastal traffic, which is very high pace uh, day and night business. Um, this can only benefit from something like this. And of course, ocean going vessels uh, will have their own dedicated solutions. And of course, then at some point, the, the crew expects some serious bandwidth as well. So this is all within the realm of possibilities with both with very powerful geos and, and with, with uh, new uh, Leo and Mio networks. So let me just illustrate this, um, who they are. Some of them I'm sure you have heard of. Um, and uh, of course, in our maritime industry, Inmarsat is, is a, a very large player. Of course, in, by, by default, where they, the incumbent um, in the L-band uh, era, um, in the last 10 years, they've done a, a, a good job with, with uh, uh, Global Express, GX, and Fleet Express. So, and, and what we have been uh, informed of is that they are already planning and have uh, financed uh, the next generation of uh, satellites already. So that will be, so you see there is a, the GX 10 A and B will be two, two HEO satellites to provide the coverage uh, over the Arctic. Um, and uh, there will be brand new constellation in 24, 25 with, which is uh, seven, eight, nine, um, new, uh, very high capacity uh, uh, geos. And then a late, um, announcement by Inmarsat is that they are uh, installing a network they want to call uh, orchestra, which will be a combination of, of what Fleet Express is today and uh, L-band and, and also terrestrial uh, cellular uh, connectivity too. So there's, there's a lot of things happening on, on, the, uh, on the Inmarsat side as well. Um, and uh, others have plans, of course, other names. Uh, SES has been there, of course, for a long time, just like uh, Teleset and Utilset, Intelset, they all have plans. Those are um, companies who have different uh, business models for, for maritime visa, either just capacity or, or buying uh, uh, or selling, offering uh, managed services. And that all this may change in the future with new players coming into the global visa game or the global broadband game. Um, I've put names like uh, OneWeb, which is a uh, KU band a Leo network, which is currently being built um, with a lot of new investors uh, by Utilsat, for example. Um, and because it's they both satellites are KU bands, so there might be some interactivity uh, there. Um, this is all going on as we speak, right? Utilsat buying higher stakes, uh, stakes in, in OneWeb. So this is, has been yesterday. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, it's a lot going on. Um, <clears throat> other new players um, in this global VSAT uh, business is uh, Biasat. I will speak about this uh, later in, in, in detail. Uh, and in Russia, there is RSCC uh, with plans to launch uh, four satellites, KU band satellites in GEO and HEO, so also to provide uh, coverage uh, on the Arctic. But I will go into more details of, of the others. So let me just, uh, yeah, uh, take it from the top uh, in my set. Um, of course, some might they sure be the incumbent. Uh, um, they have uh, more than 10,000 uh, Fleet Express installations out there. So it's definitely a success. Going forward, this is only the current constellations, but going forward, they, they will get to, uh, more capacity in with the Inmarsat had six satellites in a year and a half, two years, um, <clears throat> adding more L-band capacity and also more GX capacity. And then until the next generation, the new HEO and GEO satellites arrive in four or five years time. Another player um, certainly here in this uh, is um, uh, Viasat. And they have committed a long time ago to uh, um, to build a network with uh, three very powerful uh, KA band satellites. Um, and um, yes, uh, we will see Viasat more in this, in this business with, with their own uh, propositions. Um, and uh, yes, we have 
had terminals on the market in North America and, and their advice that is able to offer 50 megabit, 100 megabit um, on, on our antenna. So it's, it's, it's a lot of things happening on, on the regional VSAT and that can be expected to be transferred to the VSAT 3 um, global cable and coverage as well. So interesting times to see uh, what comes out of this. Uh, similar, but addressing uh, the top end of the market, that's probably the way I should phrase it, um, is uh, SES networks, who both have uh, managed services in KU band with their Scala network. Um, but um, on the uh, O3B Empower satellites, which are MEO satellites, um, there are new ones. Um, and um, yes, the, that will be addressed uh, to the very top end of the market, which in maritime visa, that is uh, cruise ships, in some instances, very large ferries, very large super yachts, um, and the offshore oil and gas uh, industry. So this is uh, for aimed for the top end of the market. Um, in the first instance, we will see how that evolves. Um, that's just uh, our way of, um, of addressing this. Um, similar, a new player, or not new, but uh, Telesat um, out of Ottawa in Canada has had um, a maritime visa business with service providers um, for a long time, and uh, uh, they are expanding their existing fleet of uh, geostationary satellites uh, with, uh, with a LEO constellations, um, and this is the how that will look like, so it's uh, it's aimed at the enterprise market, uh, large installations similar to what chips will have um, <clears throat> high usage customers. Um, so that is already a little bit different to what Elon Musk does with uh, Starlink, for example, who is mainly addressing uh, smaller businesses, uh, farms, um, and, and individuals uh, boy, living outside of uh, cellular coverage. So that's a whole other, whole other approach uh, to Leo again understanding what these different networks uh, can do and can offer in the future. Similar to OneWeb, um, it's, a, it's a dramatic and very interesting, uh, exciting story with, uh, with uh, OneWeb um, out of London, who intend to um, um, run 650 satellites. They're still launching um, regularly um, and eventually this should uh, cover most of Earth, I suppose. Um, I've, there may be some issues with some of the oceanic coverage in some areas of the world, depending on if they can build landing stations there. But it, the perspective is that regardless of uh, you would, for a LEO system, you would, uh, for this, you would need two parabolic antennas like the ones we already built. Okay, now Carl and Vida, this is uh, time for another poll, thank you. Okay, so in our next poll, we're going to look at, um, ask you about real-time monitoring of onboard equipment. So this is for the uh, people in the audience who are involved in managing operating ships. So this is something to think about if you're actually going to be monitoring equipment remotely, continuously, rather than with a store and forward, and also how much of this you're going to do might uh, drive your choice of uh, satellite communications. So if you'd like to uh, say if you're going to be doing a lot of this or not. Um, just while you're thinking, um, we should have quite a lot of time for questions. So um, if you want to put questions in the Q&A box, then uh, hopefully we'll have 20 minutes to spare for James to answer questions at, at the end. But uh, should we ready to bring up the answers, Vida? Yes, okay. So uh, nearly everybody is involved in uh, going to do real-time monitoring of onboard equipment, but uh, quite a lot of people would like to know more about it. So <laughs> pass back to James. Excellent, that was uh, very informative, thank you. Okay, um, back to the uh, presentation. So I will look at a little bit about um, what we are doing to, to accommodate all these uh, plans uh, in the future. Um, and we have had a, a series of um, very successful antenna products uh, for the last uh, many, many years, um, way back in, from the 1980s. Um, so this is why um, we have uh, certainly looked at all these uh, Leo and Mio uh, constellations, and we do have antennas deployed. Uh, keep in mind that we have built, uh, yes, it's a satellite phone for the Iridium network since the late 90s, and, and our facility in California 
uh, building the large CTEL antennas, they have built um, antennas to track LEO and MEO satellites for, for 20 years already um, in, in Earth observation satellites or weather satellites. So there's a lot of experience we have, but going forward on ships, things are, are quite different, of course, that we have we have uh, introduced something called rapid deployment technology, meaning that a lot of heavy duty stuff for de be having to deploy an antenna on a ship is uh, as close to something like plug and play, uh, which you can get uh, in this technology. And that's what we call rapid deployment technology. There is a lot of uh, cost saving measures, of course, going forward with, with more interest in VSAT, with more interest in high speed and high throughput communications, uh, the products have to follow this as well. You know, the, the attraction of being able to offer this kind of service, um, then the antenna must be able to be installed simply and then operate reliably um, afterwards. And these are these elements uh, we have uh, developed there. What we are also doing in this, knowing that going forward with, with these um, high speed and high throughput networks and with what the polls clearly tell um, that IoT will become um, something more and more important um, uh, in the shipping industry on ships, with ships. Yes, a lot of digitization has to happen uh, for sure. Um, but what we are doing here is that we have made our equipment um, IoT enabled, so to speak, right? We have implemented uh, protocols um, which are which can become part of an IoT network so that we are doing our contribution um, for, for delivering data um, to ship to, from ship to shore um, to see that such an important gateway as an, a VSAT antenna um, needs to operate. And, uh, and this is of course, what we are going to help with uh, by connecting uh, this kind of data uh, to shore. Okay, this is, uh, this is quite important uh, of course, Within the same context, um, or yes and no, uh, what we're creating to both make all of this more attractive, we and more demand will be from the operational data and from the from the crew data. Um, we have uh, done something where we have put a, a LAN interface, a powered LAN interface, inside of the antenna. Uh, that means that what we are facilitating there is um, that. Uh, a better integration of networks. So you can put a small, uh, relatively inexpensive um, cellular device, LTE device inside of a VSAT antenna and the data gets routed directly to one below deck unit. So there is no extra cable required and so forth. So we're realizing that, that networks do overlap um, and that cellular is used widely in the maritime community. So this is our contribution to make the installation more reliable, more attractive, sheltered by the elements from the dome and so forth. So that's there's a lot of factor here, um, which uh, which enables high speed connectivity uh, as well on the hardware side. So that concludes all from me today. What we're saying here is that um, we want to give the industry the uh, opportunity to to see what we're doing here. Uh, and uh, that the uh, the future is approaching uh, quickly, um, but uh, we have uh, spent uh, major investments in, in making our hardware ready um, for for these networks, um, and which you want to use in the future. Oh, well, that sounds fantastic. Okay, so now we go to the oh, we're going to another poll first. So. Um... Yeah. The last poll is uh, asking if you've got a clear understanding of your maritime communications needs over the next five years. So how fast, how reliable? I can't imagine many people do, but you may feel that not much is going to change. Um, if you want to share your, your thoughts on this one. And meanwhile, also, if you've got any questions you'd like to ask Jens. So 64% uh, do have a clear understanding. I guess I guess you want a lot of bandwidth, I suppose. Maybe that's <laughs> all the understanding you need as much as possible and as cheap as possible. And uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, I guess it's delivering it is a, is, is a hard part, isn't it? I think so. Um, yeah, that sounds that's, great. Um, there's, there will be choice for sure. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, just one one question for me while we um warm up the questions of the audience. So you mentioned this electronically steerable antenna. I think I heard about this a long time ago, 
as something in the future and you said it's something in the future now i mean it's a great promise if it gives much more reliability and less expense than the uh, antenna that has to um stabilize is it something you can share any more thoughts yeah about? yeah yeah so the uh, the uh, the potential of of uh, phased array or an actively electronically steered antennas um is that it could be um the mechanical part could be uh, um, uh, much much simpler arrangements um and uh, um but the current generation of of flat panel antennas or aesas which are on the market they are they are extremely expensive and and they are not very effective in some industries they they live with it if you drive on a, on a big four-wheel drive through north america um you will take this into account because the car is not moving around and in, in maritime everything is different Right, the antenna has to be able to deal with all these uh, different things, and it has to be uh, still an attractive uh, proposition, right? So they right now the current generation of electronic antennas are just way uh, too expensive, with only half the performance of the traditional parabolic antennas, and that is the reason why we have to do more research because none of the existing stuff would have be working properly um for what the what the what the vessel expected to to do okay um cobham you just do hardware you don't do airtime just, just for the okay. context of the next few questions people are asking about airtime prices that's not our wheelhouse uh, so to speak at all so no we did not dealing with airtime we you can just... answer these questions completely uh, objectively then about uh true internet well and, uh... i encourage people this is why this uh, do this i encourage people to contact these companies um um, and uh, they're all on the internet, uh, can be found in seconds. Um, and uh, yeah, they, that's um, something I would encourage. Okay, sure. so we've got Christos and Pradeep. So the question is about pricing, and uh, I guess you can answer this in any uh, context you like. We're not talking about your own pricing because you don't sell SATCOM, but uh, so Christos is asking, will crew internet be uh, cheaper in the future? And I think uh, with all these uh, services and commoditifying, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, we are the hardware maker, but uh, yeah, these are the. Um, I'm only highlighting the possibilities here. Is that we are not dealing with with bandwidth or airtime, so I'm not the right person to to answer that. Well, you could. What what I'm trying here to say is yes, yes, there will be, be a lot of bandwidth um, with with you know simpler antennas in the future, um, and uh, and which will be you know enabling such solutions um and uh, yeah at what cost that time will tell um but yes there will be a lot of bandwidth uh, for for maritime needs for sure yeah pradeep is asking uh, us twice we want cobham vsat pricing to be more competitive maybe he's uh missed out you know you're not actually selling vsat i, I think maybe that's a uh, so no, Pradeep, if you want to, uh, I, th I think uh, Cobham only sells the equipment, not the communications. So I think we'll maybe right. pass that on. Um, Gerhard is asking, do you consider 4G? Or just just for the audience, if you notice, you can upvote questions because we've got about eight now. So <laughs> what have we got time for? If you see Gerhard already has one upvote, then we'll, we'll answer the questions with the most upvotes first. And uh, so do you consider 4G integration? You mentioned a cellular in integration uh, on the ship, I think. That's a cellular network on the ship. You're not talking about integrating from the ship to the shore with a cellular, would you? I don't think. Yeah. Well, what we are uh, for Gerhard, what we are facilitating here is um, is the um, the hardware integration because we know that the more equipment is being installed on a vessel, the more antenna masts you have to build uh, to accommodate different uh, solutions um, and and run antenna cables to below deck to the where the the internet happens. Uh, and this is what we're trying to do here. So we are just facilitating the hardware to integrate the hardware into our VSAT antennas. And so there's only one, all the data, both our antenna data and the cellular data is then routed uh, to the um, to the below deck at the one gigabit. So that's our contribution to that. So we are not, uh, um, that could be a 4G integration, but that's that's entirely up to our customers to do. Yeah, it's kind of a complicated question because you've got cellular yeah. on the ship and cellular from the ship to the shore, which are totally different things, aren't they? Which I guess yeah, be... it's different things, yes. Yeah. Okay, so so Socrates Theodosio is asking about reliability is still low, even though bandwidth increases. But I think that was a, kind of the theme of your talk. So if you can talk to two yeah. satellites at once, you, you're solving the band, the reliability. So we're waiting for these future satellites that'll uh, 
get better and better is that the yeah yeah that's a good question um and uh, yes will it, it it will increase the capacity will increase massively over the next five years from from all the big players and new players um and uh, yes so it's uh, yeah so Cortez, let's keep an eye on 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 what's happening and uh, there may be completely new opportunities which we don't even know about for yeah. everybody involved right so uh, johan is like to ask you about your opinion on uh what Starlink's going to do. So uh, he says he knows that Starlink has plans to offer solutions to the maritime industry. I'm not sure. I haven't heard that myself, but I don't know who uh, <laughs> you had yeah. got the information from. Um, their offer is order magnitude better than the current offering in terms of connection speed and cost, but it's still a satellite communication service. So we've got to separate the satellite communications with the hardware sure. discussion, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, we're, Johan, it's a good question. Um, we are monitoring this uh, closely, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, we are filtering the internet daily uh, about these news. Yeah, we, we, we don't know what, what Starlink is going to do with regards to the maritime. They have filed the applications with the FCC that they want to do something, but they might just focus on very specific uh, uh, market segments. I don't think they will uh, address uh, global shipping. Um, they might address, you know, coastal traffic, um, inland waterways uh, where people stand still for a long time. You know, depends on what the solution is um, and what where they want to play with this. But they're looking at, at generally at the markets quite differently because it hasn't been designed as a mobility market, which other satellite operators they know their mobility customers, of course. And uh, uh, Starlink is not really that kind of company but let us let's see it's certainly exciting uh, what will happen and it, do you want to give some thoughts about the technology i read because it goes up to the leo and down to the leo so it's only going to work if you're within 700 yeah. miles of the earth station build less expensive satellites but need more landing stations others are more advanced with less landing stations so time will tell how that uh, will develop yeah Wow. So uh, Shane Biggie is at the top of the list now. Can you further develop your IoT capability? Are you compressing the data? I suppose the compression is maybe a software thing, not a hardware thing, is it? So maybe not. Yeah, it is. yeah. well, it's, it's our software eventually outputting uh, antenna data through these uh, uh, um, IoT protocols. Um, so in MQTT, SNMP, and with a RESTful API, there is a there's uh, some compression going on, but I don't know the compression rate. Oh, sounds great. So Isidore Il Boudou, so he's uh, getting a, don't you think uh, these electronically steerable antennas are going to win in the end and you're not developing your own one? I don't know if we're getting in the realm of secrecy here and you're maybe not able to answer that, are you? Was... Um, uh, I can, we, we are doing research into these, um, but uh, with the efficiency and so forth, what, what these can be, uh, become it. It will probably for certain maritime market segments um, where where these make sense. But I don't believe that um, uh, the ESAs, the electronically steered antennas, that they will be the right solutions for for everybody. Because in the end, physically, a parabolic antenna will always be the the better performing option um, for a very very long time. So this is why we have completely redesigned. Um, the platform and have launched a whole new platform of antennas. So this to be able to deal with all that. It's about having the strongest possible radio beam fired very precisely at a satellite. Yeah, and I yeah. guess you can do that more easily with a parabolic yeah. antenna than. Yes, more. It's just more efficient uh, than than any of the flat panels. But let's see what the future will bring. It might be fine for some markets, but certainly not for all. Well, wow, okay. So Kuzru Sanjana is asking, uh, is antenna pricing coming down? I don't know if you're able to answer this. Are you? <laughs> Kuzru, uh, thanks for posing this. Yeah, long time no see. Um, yes, um, eventually, you know, we're looking at, uh, uh, of course, um, at, at these market developments, um, of course, and uh, we've just made some major investments in, in, in a factory in Asia. Um, so we, we, we are on our path, right, so that um, our manufacturing is, is moving to Asia and, and we expect some, uh, to get some help for, to uh, remain competitive, uh, for sure. Oh, so um, oh, I should have read these uh, questions already. Jonathan Hipponia is asking, can the antenna address that a VSAT beam is already saturated with a lot of user and choose a better beam? 
yeah, I know that's not part of this discussion, but you have to be happy to if you send me questions um, afterwards. Um, here's my email address I put back on the screen here. Um, please feel free to to send me these questions afterwards. And I will sort this out offline with you. Well, very good. And I think uh, Pradeep Neji, so he's a, he's a customer. He has 60 VSAT installed on his fleet. He says he likes the product, but the price is too high. So please look into this. I guess uh, I'm not sure there's much more. <laughs> right. So you're doing everything you can to keep your pricing as competitive as possible. Isn't it? Sure. Oh. Where should we go now? So Sven Licker Larsen is asking um, about IoT protocols. Are we going to need more data formats and protocols? I'm not sure. I mean, you're, you're handling the data. You're not actually looking at the data itself. So maybe you don't need to worry about the and the protocols are for the software to deal with, I suppose, would you say? No, not really. But uh, if uh, what Sven uh, implies here, uh, if there is a new data format uh, required at some point, those are just the protocols we have decided for the time being. Um, if something else evolves, which makes more sense um, in this whole IoT setup, uh, for sure, we will implement this. As the all the antennas are software controlled, there's a lot of things we can do here, right? Oh, then uh, so Kuzru is asking, do we foresee a nature of a single antenna with multiple networks? I think that's kind of what we were talking about in the presentation, wasn't it? I think. Um, not sure uh, what he's implying there. So at the moment, of course, you have to sign up with with one provider um, to have that antenna working on those particular satellites, which the provider is is providing. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, what he, I think, uh, what he, I'm not sure if that's what he meant meant um, um, that um, it can go from, you can use KU in different KU networks, of course, uh, depending on the provider, but but on the fly between KU and KA, that's not uh, in the in the cards, but some, something which is more interesting is uh, what we have actually tested is the ability to switch between a KU band geo satellite and a KU band Leo network that is in the realm of possibilities uh, for sure on the existing uh, KU band antennas out there. So that we have tested uh, in a prototype setup. Um, so that that in that case, that's a possibility. If that's he's, what you, uh, he's added an extra connect. That's what he meant. He meant, can you talk to Leo, Mio, Geo, and one? But uh, I don't oh, think any yeah. satellite company is actually offering all three at one go. So. Yeah. No, well, it depends on the bands because the RF uh, is, of course, and this uh, the modem is is controls the antenna, right? So if if there will be some platform that that's able to handle that, um, of course, you still have to stay within either KU band or KA band uh, one at a time. But it's possible between to, to switch between uh, Leo and KA band, uh, Geo and KA band, and Mio and KA band. That's that's in the realm of possibilities. Oh, okay. Well, that's no, no more questions on, on, on the board. I mean, the one I'm thinking of is just thinking of the audience. So if we have got IT managers who maybe haven't done that much in maritime specifically, or don't know that much about satellite, but know about software. So what's, you know, if you wanted to leave sort of five lines for people, the, the what they need to understand, I mean, is the picture here that we're, the costs will go down, the I mean, it's not going to be simple, but you'll have more available to you as all these satellite networks launch and uh, There'd be a lot more potential and as shipping companies want to do more and more monitoring which seems inevitable that's going to get easier to do yes. yeah um yeah definitely um the um the it will be easier so the the, the pricing discussion is always there we still talk about satellites whether or you have you're launching three or four geostationary satellites or or a low density leo network with 192 satellites the, the investments are always the same, right? It's, we're talking three, four, five billion dollars worth of investment for a new satellite constellation. Um, so yes, they, they will be able to to manage the bandwidth differently, to give the the, the experience uh, of of proper internet uh, to the end user. So whether or not this will be the what you get for your money, I think will be will be uh, uh, the interesting part in the future. Um, again, I'm not the the big bandwidth or airtime uh, expert, but uh, for sure, what we are we're making a lot of strides uh, to to build competitive uh, terminals, and we still believe uh, that this is the case. 
Okay, so this question here from Yuka. I don't know if we're going into commercial confidentiality here. So the XTR systems, that's the that's the um, the carbon antenna. We're in the process yeah. of purchasing, and we want the new technology. I'm not sure what you want to hear from here. But. <laughs> yeah. I know, but I know, yeah, yeah. This, okay. uh, of course, right. this is this is the the, the launch plan, uh, which I manage here uh, is um, of course staggered. Um, that the one meter KU and and now that the next will be the one meter KA will be launched now the new Sailor XTR antennas and in Q1 uh, 22 where we are relaunching the uh, the sub one meter antennas the 80 centimeter and the 60 centimeter in the different bands uh, all over again on the new XTR platform uh, so yes that's that's going to happen and but that's only the very short term roadmap so to speak. Oh, okay. Well, there must be more we can talk about about Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, since uh, it's a very interesting with a lot of impact. I know it's only very we don't know very much, and we're just guessing. But uh, you, you talked you talked earlier about the billionaires competing against each other, so uh, they're going to launch as many satellites as they can, and they're going to bring the price down. And it must all be good news for shipping and good news for antenna manufacturers. But, yeah, let's let's see what I said uh, initially when we spoke uh, beforehand. Is the it's horses for courses, right? They they uh, they built. A, a network for uh, residential broadband and uh, small office, home office uh, arrangements in, in remote areas. Um, and uh, we have yet to see, and it's interesting yeah, that, that Silicon Valley is, is uh, interested in satellite now, but it's kind of like the last frontier thing, right? They've conquered the internet. There is now generating so much money um, that they can start building uh, satellite networks. That's a very interesting uh, uh, way um, of looking at this. So Jeff Bezos with uh, SpaceX Starlink um, is already very active in, in the in the sort of uh, residential broadband market in North America and some in Europe markets in Europe as well. We will see if he can compete with the with the terrestrial networks. Um, and uh, and then yes, in the meantime, there's also OneWeb, uh, and then there will be Amazon of some sort, Amazon has just acquired the satellite activity from Facebook. So that was there as well, right? So there's a lot of hype space activity uh, um, in, in this business at the moment, but not all will come through, not all are interested in maritime. So we have to be very careful to say that now they all you know, make this available. I mean, do you want to clarify that a bit? I mean, you imagine this service is available everywhere on the globe, so it doesn't matter whether they target maritime or not in, in that sense. I mean, if it works well, anywhere. It well, if it is, I have I have an other information where the um, in some cases the geographical availability of some networks doesn't go above forty five degrees, fifty two degrees latitude, um, and that means that in our industry, in the which is the, the core market for VSAT for sure, means that um, um, you know with with that kind of installation, you have to be careful that will you be able to go into Europe uh, because if if the satellite coverage stops uh, in, at about Dover, then you know you, the ship doesn't have any connectivity north of of the English Channel. So that's just an, one of the implications um, to say, okay, horses for courses. Uh, there is very successful regional satellites which are serving regional customers, um, and uh, and something similar will happen here. Uh, that that all these different networks will have to find their specific market segment and 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 also um, um, where to play, how to play and how they want to offer this. Uh, but it will not be one answer for everything. Okay, so Raphael Pilch, I've looked up Raphael on LinkedIn. I can see he's director of United Short Sea Lines in Gdynia. So he's asking if I'm doing a new build in uh, two or three years, you're going to recommend a VSAT and Iridium backup or two small VSATs? Is that a easy question well, to answer? Yeah, it depends on the so the sweet spot for most operators is still the one meter antenna class for for global uh, VSAT. Um, yes, and then there are service providers offering um, the uh, backup or the backdoor into the VSAT system um, through L band, which uh, yeah, which could be Iridium or Imasat in that case. Okay, so we've got a very technical question here from Christopher Janus. I think what he's saying, so there's a proposal about a performance standard for ECDIS, electronic chart display systems about uh, secure communications. Do you know anything about how to make that work on VSAT? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that the uh, the secure protocols will have nothing to do with the communications themselves. It'll probably be about 
encryption no. and that kind of thing. Well, I don't know much about yeah. it. I don't know if you do. Well, no, that that's right. We are we are not supplying complete solutions. We are the antenna makers and developers, right? And and keep that going uh, because that's important. So the uh, um, the antenna is not connected directly to the internet. It goes everything has to go through the onboard uh, IT system, which is the VSAT modem, router switches, and this whole onboard uh, network setup. Yeah, I mean, we can stick to cybersecurity for a while. I mean, it, sometimes people say antennas are one of the easiest things to hack locally when you've got systems that don't change the default passwords. I don't know if you have any thoughts you'd like to share on, on the cybersecurity well, side of it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point to bring up. Um, this has happened, and there have been incidences when uh, some hackers have contacted us uh, with regards to cybersecurity, and the response was that there, there have been VSAT modems out there at some point which were programmed at the uh, uh, with the same passwords out there but again it's 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 the the IT setup which the service provider puts on the vessel this is where the cybersecurity comes in right we are making sure that for our antennas there is uh, secure software which which the whole computer which controls the antennas is a linux computer with very uh, intricate uh, programming where the uh, where the software only communicates with a chip, with a key chip, and uh, you cannot upload malware, you cannot upload or you cannot hack into such antenna. So from basically from our side, we have made sure that our contribution to this kind of discussion is, is that, but the protocols, all the output comes from the onboard IT system, which includes the VSAT modem, the routers and so forth. So uh, that's, uh, that's not our wheelhouse directly. Oh, okay. I thought maybe the, the latency question we can go into a bit more depth because you had an interesting you, you had the numbers you said 50 milliseconds for um leos and 250 milliseconds for geos and i think you said that's yeah. one way so you're talking about half a second so it might be interesting to share some thoughts about when this is when this matters and when this doesn't matter so i, I guess half a second is not a long time if you're having a voice telephone conversation but if you're yeah. logging into software remotely and you have to wait half a second between when you press something and something comes up yeah it for sure, um, this is a um, this will be a decision where where the, the solution will dictate which which network. Because if you want to provide internet, high speed internet, um, to uh, with with off the shelf um, commercial applications, then in in many many cases, um, high speed uh, satellites, geo satellites, very powerful, uh, can deliver a lot of internet. And give them a very good experience on board, and then uh, it could very well be that when if there is a low latency requirement, if you in earnest want to monitor real life equipment on board, be it flow meters uh, for the fuel or, uh, or uh, monitor the automation systems, uh, the high power electricism, or whatever has an IP address can be monitored, right? And in some cases, depending on the vessel type. Um, this will be um, a requirement for sure that, that this can be real life um, and uh, so that you really know what's going on and not to, uh, uh, so horses for courses, um, it will be, will be solutions uh, for everybody for sure. I mean, the difference between 50 milliseconds and 250 milliseconds is surely not going to matter in remote monitoring of software, but surely it's, it's more important if you're using say cloud software on board the ship that you can't really use on yeah, that could be even, and again depends on, on on other application some have even brought up when it's when it's a yacht for example then then gaming might be an issue right low latency um on some very large super yachts you know trading on online um where the latency comes in on 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 the trading systems uh, right so it's you know this this there's a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of opportunities here for for uh, low latency uh, to to help the maritime industry with a lot of things for sure. Yeah, but you also said so. Watching video on a ship, you don't actually need low latency because it's buffering. I think that's an important thing to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's really can do the the, the you. There's still, or well, there are also going to be very powerful geo satellites which will provide a, a brilliant uh, user experience uh, with regards to the internet for sure. Yeah, but it's one of these sort of stories that seems, keeps coming up that you have a an, an IT manager in a shipping company who might have used some maintenance software that's designed for a 
factory and knows how to use it and wants to put it on a ship and it just doesn't work but uh I guess these are kind of things that people need to bear in mind and sort of know about but you can solve just about any problem with a higher latency as long as you know as long as you're prepared for it I suppose is that the yeah yeah you could uh, you could say that oh well, it sounds great well we've got um five minutes left and there's no more questions so I don't know if you'd like to give us all concluding remarks to uh give yeah. people something uh, to go home with what you'd like to people to remember uh, thank you very much uh, thank you all for <laughs> for sticking uh, with us here for for this uh, little hour and uh, some uh, familiar names uh, there in the audience I could see this only confirms is that uh, uh, what we are discussing and have been discussing for a number of years and uh, uh, and uh, this is uh, a, a great thing that I can convey these things uh, in this in this forum uh, and for sure and the message from here is that uh, we are in this fight, right? Uh, we are we are not uh, looking at, into this from the sidelines. Uh, these uh, we are monitoring these uh, satellite constellations. We're talking to all of them, um, and uh, that's the important part for us uh, to to be part of that. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff to know, and I hope everybody thinks it's been worth worth uh, keeping up to date with. So I'll just pass back to Vida for the closing words. Thank you. Thank you. So you've heard Jan Severling from Cobham explaining how Cobham, Cobham's new generation Sailor XTR platform is paving the way for the future of VSAT communications. Thank you for tuning in today. Next week, we are looking into cybersecurity compliance in our webinar, and you still have time to register. Now, Digital Ship is signing off. Take care. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you all.